Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. It's somehow August 1st already. Wait, really? It's, yes, it's August 1st. 2021, and since basically your entire life has already zoomed by in a frenetic blur of blinky lights, speed lines, and that sound that a train makes when it goes past, I doubt you were able to pay much attention to the tech news this past week, but never fear, I will bring you up to speed. First, gaming PCs are not banned in California and five other states. Also, AMD officially announced the 6600 XT with an August 11th launch date. Zen 4 and RDNA 3 are on track for 2022. Intel changed 10 to 7, and there's already NVIDIA 40 series rumors. There's also a lot of doom and gloom about the seemingly interminable global chip shortage, so let's take a closer look. Excellent! So Joe, uh, this first bit uh, gets a little bit editorial, and I thought like it could pop up a warning that says like, warning, editorial content, but that's just an idea. So I don't know if that, or maybe just something lower bottom down here, something like that. Warning, editorial, I don't know. Go ahead, if you feel like it. California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Hawaii, and Vermont are banning gaming PCs, is what a clown car full of morons was screaming all week, allowing themselves to be manipulated due to Dell's lack of planning. See, back in 2016, California decided to implement CEC regulations to limit the idle power consumption of PCs, giving system integrators like Dell five plus years to prepare for the rollout, which came in several stages. The other states mentioned decided to follow suit because a 2015 report estimated that the cumulative cumulative power consumption from PCs was going to get out of hand by 2040 if idle power draw in particular was not reined in. For DIY builders in particular, you should note that this does not apply to you. These rules affect system builders who sell entire PCs who have a well-documented bad habit of dropping the crappiest, most inefficient power supply possible into a system in order to save a few bucks on the base cost. Hence the phrase I've uttered many times before, since the egg expert days even, never skimp on the power supply. On July 1st, the latest phase of the rollout took effect, and Dell decided to just post a message on their website, indicating that they simply couldn't ship a handful of their smallest PCs to those six states because of these new rules. Never mind that Dell had five years to simply spend maybe five more bucks per unit to add a decent 80 plus gold rated power supply to these PCs. No, they'd rather post this half-assed message calling out those damned regulations instead. This message, and the many hot take articles that it spawned like this one, were thinly veiled attempts to mask Dell's lack of planning by tapping into the cesspool that is the current political climate in the US. The mere use of the word California is enough to provoke a select few of my viewers to make known their outrage towards the citizens and legislature of my state, I've found, which is apparently a socialist hellscape bereft of any redeeming values. And you know what? I can handle that. My response is usually the same. They're right. California sucks, actually, and you should definitely never come here. But let's not get mired in the political undercurrent of this story. That's exactly what they want us to do. Whether you agree with them or not, the fact that these regulations actually account for a lot of the power draw variances from PC to PC that can exist, like the difference between a full-size workstation with a grip of expansion slots versus a mini ITX system like those crappy Dell Alienware Aurora PCs, means that it took some reading and investigation to figure out what they actually apply to. So I'd like to say thank you to Jay of Jay's Two Cents and Steve from Gamers Nexus for posting some of the first content on this topic that properly looked at the related documents to suss out those details and clarify the situation. There's a legitimate discussion to be had here around the benefits and efficacy of this kind of regulation, but that discussion is lost if the conversation from the get-go is based on prevarication at best or at worst, outright lies. Okay, let's talk about some news that wasn't excavated from Dell's cornhole. AMD officially announced the Radeon RX 6600 XT at China Joy 2021, Asia's biggest gaming convention, and responses have been mixed. While many have waited for RDNA 2 to make its way to more affordable mid-range cards, the 6600 XT will launch on August 11th for $380 MSRP, just $20 shy of Nvidia's RTX 3060 Ti. One can't help but think that if you could actually buy a 3060 Ti for 400 bucks, AMD would have been more aggressive with their pricing, but we all know that street prices are insane, so why would Team Red bother competing with a price that essentially does not exist? It's also frustrating to see a $100 price jump over the previous gen's 600 level card, the 5600 XT, which launched for $280. Beyond the price though, the 6600 XT sports 32 compute units, 8 gigabytes of 16 gigabit per second GDDR6 VRAM on a 192 bit bus, and a 2589 megahertz boost clock. There will be no reference version 
of the card either. The one that you've seen leaked pictures of is just an artistic rendering, according to AMD, which fuels further speculation that third-party designs will list for an even higher price than that base cost of $380. AMD also dropped some info about their next-gen CPU and GPU plans this week, as Dr. Lisa Su revealed on their earnings call Tuesday that Zen 4-based Ryzen CPUs and RDNA 3-based Radeon GPUs are on track to launch in 2022. That's in addition to the Zen 3 CPUs with 3D vCache that they teased during Computex back in June, so AMD has a lot planned for next year. The RDNA 3-based Radeon 7000 series GPUs are rumored to use a MCM or multi-chip module design, similar to how Ryzen CPUs can use multiple chiplets, and there are many questions surrounding how this might affect yields and performance since it hasn't really been done with a mainstream consumer GPU before. Their Zen 4-based CPUs, codenamed Raphael, could also feature onboard RDNA 2 graphics, as well as support for DDR5, PCIe Gen 5, and an LGA socket rather than PGA. They're not expected until late 2022 though, so there's still a lot to be revealed in the meantime. Speaking of late 2022, that's also the rumored earliest launch date for Nvidia's next gen 40 series graphics cards, if Twitter leaks are to be believed. The code name for the 40 series architecture is Lovelace, named for the Right Honorable Countess of Lovelace, widely regarded as the world's first computer programmer and infamous flibbertigibbet Grayman 55. <laughs> I can't say this sentence. And infamous flibbertigibbet Grayman 55 on Twitter is convinced that the chips will be manufactured on TSMC's 5 nanometer node, either N5 or the optimized N5P upgrade. Either way, it appears to be a monolithic design rather than MCM like the aforementioned Radeon RDNA 3 GPUs, so we'll likely see a face-off between the two design approaches. The flagship 40 series GPU is currently rumored to support 144 streaming multiprocessors and as many as 18,432 next-gen CUDA cores. Igor's lab shared some insider info about Intel's Alder Lake S desktop CPUs that will launch at the end of 2020. As we've seen before, the launch apparently will still take place within the time frame Intel promised, but we won't be seeing a full product stack. The flagship unlocked K-SKU processors, likely a 12900K, 12700K, and 12600K if Intel sticks with their naming scheme, will launch alongside motherboards based on the high-end Z690 chipset sometime between October 25th and November 19th, while lower-end CPUs and B and H series chipsets will be pushed to early 2022, likely just in time for CES in January. The more limited launch in 2021 is likely due to a lagging PCI Express Gen 5 rollout, which involves multiple parties and is somewhat necessary if Intel wants to show off the capabilities of their new platform. At the same time, board partners have apparently rejected Intel's ATX 12 volt only project, which wanted to move some power supply components onto the motherboard in a bid to improve overall efficiency. This would add to the cost and complexity of motherboards, however, so if Igor's sources are correct, it has been shelved for now. Finally, despite my recent videos on the subject, big tech companies are not at all optimistic about the ongoing chip shortage, with multiple CEOs weighing in on the topic this week with dire warnings about supply. Apple CEO Tim Apple hinted at rationing chip supplies. AMD CEO Lisa Su said they'll be focusing on the most strategic segments of the PC market. And Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger warned that shortages will get worse in the second half of 2021, and it will be a year or two before supplies return to normal. So the chips that are available will be going into the most expensive products in order to maximize profits for these companies, while the industry slowly builds out more fabs and attempts to grapple with bottlenecks in production, like the fact that there's only one company that makes the ABF substrates that Intel needs to package its processors. Samsung is also upping their semiconductor wafer prices in order to raise money to expand their manufacturing capacity, which could directly impact the prices of cell phones and NVIDIA 30 series GPUs. Not that those cards were selling for anywhere close to reasonable prices anyway, but I think there's two ways to view this. One, yes, demand is crazy high and these companies likely know best what challenges they might be facing in the next year or two. They should be informing the public of their expectations. At the same time though, it sure must be nice to be a tech manufacturer right now, to be able to say the shortage situation is just out of our control. And as a result, we're only gonna be able to sell the highest margin versions of our products for the maximum price the market will bear. Actually, speaking of a bear market, Actually, no, this is not investment advice. Forget I even said that. Yay, the economy. And now let's slip into something more comfortable. That's right, it's time for tech briefs. Intel got tired of the 14 nanometer memes and they didn't want that to happen with their 10 nanometer node 2. So they've finally done something about it by renaming 10 to 7. 
Now, sure, a cynic might see this as a poorly conceived marketing stunt meant to establish false equivalence between Intel and AMD, but others, including Dr. Ian Tech Tech Potato Cutris, have hailed it as a good move because using nanometers to define process nodes hasn't been accurate for a while now. And Intel's 10 nanometer is actually on par with TSMC's 7 nanometer in terms of transistor density. And so, Intel 10 nanometer enhanced superfin is now Intel 7, which is what Alder Lake will be based on. And 7 nanometer is now 4, 7 plus is now 3, and 5 is now 20A in a very understandable progression that's not confusing at all. Thanks, Intel. Speaking of TSMC, Taiwan has given the chip manufacturer approval to go ahead with its most advanced plant ever, building a two nanometer fab in Sinchu on the northwest side of the island. Environmental Review approved the plan Wednesday and construction will begin in 2022 with equipment installation slated for 2023. Notably, the plant will consume a lot of water, 98,000 tons a day, about 50% of TSMC's current usage, which is significant. So they're also working to outfit the fab to use 100% reclaimed water by 2030. Back to some more Samsung news, with DDR5 on the horizon, they are working on developing compatible ICs that have some impressive potential specs. 24 gigabit DDR5 integrated circuits are currently being tested, and you can stack those eight high, giving you 24 gigabytes of storage on one unit, and you can fit 32 of those units onto one DIMM. So that's a single stick of DDR5 with potentially 768 gigabytes of RAM on it. Eight of those in a quad channel high-end desktop or server means 12 terabytes of system memory. We don't even have 12 terabyte SSDs yet, so yeah, that's a lot of RAM. Finally, Sony has enabled the M.2 slot in the PS5, allowing for PC-like storage expansion on the popular console for those who have been able to buy one, of course. It's NVMe compatible and will support PCIe 4.0 by four devices with 250 gigabytes to two terabytes of storage. NASCompares.com has a nice article and video covering compatible SSDs and installation, and you can fit up to a M.2 22110 drive in there, which allows for some flexibility. No snarky comments from me here. I just think it's good to see Sony allowing customers to upgrade their consoles without forcing them to use some stupid proprietary solution. But there you have it, guys. Tech news for the week. And I still can't quite believe that we're in month eight of 2021 now. Tempest Fugit, as the Romans used to say. I'd like to hear what you guys have to say, though, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below while you're down there. All the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. You can also click that like button if you enjoyed this video. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for an excellent selection of merchandise, including uh, what should be uh, these glasses back in stock. And subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in the next one.